So that's the question. The Bible's under a lot of attack today. Uh, it's uh, under a lot of scrutiny. And so, uh, uh, but the reality is it's always been under a lot of scrutiny. There have always been people through the ages who have tried to discredit the scriptures. And so the question is, is how do we know that the Bible's God's word? How do we know it's not the Quran or the Bhagavad Gita or some other uh, religious writing that that's the word of God and this one actually isn't? And so we want to wrestle with that question today and we want to think about it. Uh, one of the things that we're going to look at uh, initially are the internal claims. You see a number of other things that we're going to be talking about today as well. And so the question is, does the Bible even claim that for itself? So why would we even assume that it's the Word of God if it doesn't claim to be the Word of God? And so uh, we want to look at uh, a few passages of Scripture to find out what are the internal claims? What are the claims that Scripture has? Uh, one of the most well-known, all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So what is the initial claim? All Scripture is breathed out by God. Is, uh, the word is translated in some versions, inspired by God. Uh, the, uh, the key thing is, is the claim is not talking about inspired like an artist is inspired, where the, the, this is not about an internal in inspiration, but an external inspiration. It's not internal to me, it's external to me. It's external to the writers. The writers of scripture had an external source. They didn't just write what their thoughts were about God. They were writing what God had revealed to them and inspired them to write. And in fact, the process uh, we see a little bit more in uh, 2 Peter, where Peter tells us uh, uh, what that process was, but he also makes the claim that it's not up to the individual author, the individual writer in 2 Peter 1, 21, or 20 and 21. He says, knowing this, first of all, that no prophet Prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. That's a key statement, by the way, uh, because uh, the idea is that uh, we seek uh, what the meaning is. And many times people say, what does it mean? And then, and then you'll hear, well, I think it means, and all of a sudden it's about me and my thought about what Scripture means. And, and in fact, a movement uh, happened uh, or has happened from the uh, intent of the author to the intent of the audience, the intent of the reader. And so we've moved from an objective or a seeking what is God intended by this to what do I want it to mean or think it means or want it to mean. And so I can make it mean anything I want. And scripture says no to that. It says no, it's not a matter of your own interpretation. It's not an internal interpretation. That is also external. That is what God wants it to be. Uh, it says, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of men, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. God used each author's uh, uh, personalities, their ability with grammar. You'll see that as you, uh, uh, like when I started studying uh, Greek, uh, uh, the first year we just studied the basics of Greek. The second half of the second year, we got into the Gospel of John because John's gr uh, Greek uh, grammar and such and, and word choices are more simple uh, than, say, the author of Hebrews, uh, which is more complex. And so you realize that God used even the author's own understanding uh, uh, of the language or uh, their personalities, how they wrote. Uh, but what they wrote was carried along by the Holy Spirit. The content of that was driven by God, not by the individual author. And so that's the claim of Scripture. It's not the claim of a lot of scholarship today where scholars will say, oh no, this was just men's thoughts about God. There are many, many uh, scholars that would say that today, but that's not the claim of scripture. And so to, for it to claim one thing and for us to go and say, oh no, it was something else, uh, we're, we're discounting even what it says internally about itself. Um, so what were they thinking? What did they have in mind when they were thinking about Scripture? Well, certainly most of us would say, well, they had the Old Testament Scripture, so that's what they were talking about. They were only talking about the Old Testament, not about the New Testament. And, and you see Paul referring to the Old Testament in Romans chapter 3. 
where he says, then what advantage has the Jew or what value of circumcision much in every way to begin with? The Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. They were trusted with the word of God. They were the ones that brought the Old Testament to us. They were the ones that protected it, that, that took care of it, that transcribed it so that we have it today. And so they were entrusted with a great uh, privilege, a great Thing. But Paul didn't just have in mind the writings of the Old Testament. We see that he also had in mind the writings of the New Testament. And we see this initially in 1 Thessalonians 2. It says, And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. Why did he have to say that? Because he was not just referring to the Old Testament at that moment, I don't believe. Now you could say, oh, well, he was just referring to the Old Testament. Then why did he say this? Why did he say you accepted it? Because they already accepted the Old Testament scriptures. So I think he was referring to the New Testament. And we see that borne out in some of the other uh, things that are said in scripture. In 1 Timothy 5.18, you see this, uh, these two quotes, the scripture says. So he's clearly saying, here's what is scripture. And then he says, you shall not muzzle the ox when it treads out the grain. That's found in Deuteronomy. Then he says, the laborer deserves his wages. That is not found anywhere in the Old Testament. It's found in Luke's gospel, in Luke 10, uh, 10 uh, 7. Uh, and so you'll see this, uh, this he's, he's, he's calling Luke's gospel, at least, and probably Luke's writings, scripture. This, Luke was a guy who was... Um, uh, was close to Peter. And so we, I mean, close to him, uh, uh, Mark was close to Peter. Uh, uh, he was close to, uh, to Paul. And so here was a Pauline disciple and he's already calling his writings scripture. And so you go, wow, this is, I mean, it, that's, a, that's a huge claim. That's a huge claim that, that, that Luke's writings, his gospel, his, the book of Acts. Uh, you see Luke, Quoting Jesus has in mind that the Apocrypha is not part of the scriptures. And this is a verse that I'm sure all of you have memorized. Uh, it says, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, it will re be required of this generation. And, and, uh, and, and everybody said, amen, right? Uh, and you think, well, how does this point to the fact that the Apocrypha is not included? Well, what's the death of Abel? Very first death in the Old Testament. So what is, the, what is Zechariah? the last one of Second Chronicles. And there are other deaths in the Apocrypha, and so he's excluding, he's clearly, Jesus is clearly saying, and Luke's recording, that the, that the Old Testament scriptures that the Jews were responsible for go from Genesis to Second Chronicles. That was the last, in the order of the Hebrew Bible, Second Chronicles was the last book. We have Malachi as the last. But that would include chronologically all the, all the minor prophets, all the major prophets. But when you look at history, it would exclude the Apocrypha. And so clearly not saying that the Apocrypha was part. Peter has in mind Paul's writings of scripture. Uh, he says, um, and count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul. So he's clearly talking about Paul. He says, who also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters. So he's talking about all his letters, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus. I mean, a lot of books of our New Testament, 13 letters. And he says, uh, when he speaks in them of these things, these matters, there are some things in them that are hard to understand. No, duh. I mean, wow, we're still wrestling with some of it, right? Uh, and he says, uh, they're hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist, we see that a lot, and we probably have done our own share of that at times, to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. So he's clearly saying Paul's writings are included with scripture. These are, uh, uh, they, they do it to the other scriptures just like they do it to Paul's writing. Um, so since the Bible claims Old Testament and New Testament to be uh, uh, the, uh, the scriptures, then we have something we need to wrestle with. We need something that needs to be evaluated. One of the questions that we got to ask ourselves is how do we know it's the Bible and not some other religious writing? I, I want to deal with that first. And, and you have to go back to, the, uh, uh, to number eight, uh, which I'm gonna, is, is going to be retitled, Do All Roads Lead to God? That's going to be the title, the new title, instead of Buckles Barometers number eight, you know, which no, everybody goes, what is that one about? Uh, and so, Do All Roads Lead to God? 
Basically, if you remember when we went through that, and you may want to go back because I'm just giving a quick summary of this. When we looked at all the other worldviews, we realized that there's a, there's a flaw, there's a fatal flaw in each of the worldviews except for theism. Uh, the fatal flaw for atheism, you ask one question, do you know everything? If you know everything, then you're God. If you don't know everything, then, then, then God may exist where you do not know. So you can't be an atheist, you can only be an agnostic. Uh, deism fails because, in fact, it failed, uh, uh, made some resurgent recently, but it failed in the, uh, uh, about the founding of our nation around that time frame, 1776-ish. Uh, it failed because the question was, well, if God can create the biggest miracle, why can't he do smaller miracles? Deism says that God can't do miracles, that he's not involved in our world, that he just wound it up, if I can use that uh, analog type technology. I don't even know if we have wind up things anymore. Uh, they're all battery driven. Uh, but uh, he wound up the world, got it going, and then he just kind of sits back and lets it happen. Uh, so that's the problem with that. Finite Godism, panentheism, and polytheism all fail for the same reason. They all fail because um, if you have a finite God, then something has to be infinite that caused that finite to be, and therefore every one of those fails. And so that's, that's a question in a lot of different religious circles that you start seeing, oh wow, uh, uh, this has a finite God. Uh, you see, in fact, even in, in Mormonism, and, uh, which I would put it under polytheism, a lot of our uh, uh, statistics puts it, under, uh, puts it under theism, or a lot of our, you know, when it says uh, so many Christians believe such, you know, X, uh, they include Mormonism under, under theism, but it actually should fall under polytheism. Uh, a key statement of theirs is, uh, as, as uh, uh, we are God once was, as uh, God is, we shall become. And so you're basically saying, you know, I'm finite, so basically they're saying the original God was finite also. You can, a finite can't become infinite, and so you have a, you have a fatal flaw there. And so you end up with pantheism, uh, which you see second from the end over there. Pantheism, uh, once you d deal with the issue of a personal God versus an impersonal God, uh, if God is personal, if he is intelligent, and there's intelligent design, the whole intelligent design argument, then therefore that one fails as well. You're left with theism with three views, uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And the, and the key thing there is the resurrection of Christ. Did he rise from the dead? Did he not? And if he rose from the dead, then it's Christianity and not the other two. If he didn't rise from the dead, then maybe it's one of the other two, or maybe, maybe we're, all, we're all wrong. So uh, that's a key thing. That's why I dealt with the resurrection of Jesus uh, in the Buckles Barometer 9, which is not posted yet, but uh, will be at some point. So to what degree does the Bible claim to be God's word? Is it to the details or is it just kind of the general ideas? I mean, there's some that would say it's the, the concepts that are inspired, but not the details. It's not the words. And for me, the concepts mean nothing if the details mean nothing. And so I, I, that's important to me as a believer in Christ. And, I, and, and so we have to ask the question, though, what, to what degree does the Scripture say that they're inspired? Uh, and Scripture says to the very smallest part. Um, I've heard people say, well, it's not, it's not the jot and tittle. And it's like, well, that's Jesus' words. He said it's the jot and tittle. And if you read the King James, which is the iota and the dot. The iota is a, is a Greek letter, uh, and it's the smallest of the Greek letters. Here's the whole Greek alphabet. These are the capitals, and these are the, the small letters. And, and so you look through this, and that's the smallest of the letters. And you've got a few letters that are close. Uh, but they, this one just has one stroke and other ones have multiple strokes. And so he's saying not the smallest letter. And then he says dot. Uh, you, you saw in the, in the translation it said, uh, previously it says not a dot. Uh, it can either be dot or just an extension on a letter. Uh, and so you look at this and you think, well, there's no dot anywhere. And there's no le two letters that look very similar, uh, but just have one little difference. And so I don't think he's referring to the Greek alphabet. I think he's, he says Oda, clearly referring to the Greek alphabet, because that's the name of the, uh, of the letter. I think the smallest dot would be the hard pronunciation versus the soft pronunciation, in that case, of a B. That's, uh, and, they, and it re reads from, this, uh, you know, from right to left. And so you've got the Aleph being the first letter of the 
uh, uh, of the Hebrew alphabet, and then bait, and then there's a different pronunciation for the B with the softer sound. Uh, the, the other thought is that it's not the dot, but it's the actual, uh, just an extension uh, on a letter. And so if you use that, you have uh, the, the bait or the B. Notice it has just a little extension past that straight uh, line uh, that the cop doesn't have. So the, the whole difference between uh, a letter is just one little mark, one little piece of the letter. And so I wanted to use something that we could kind of look at in terms of English to kind of have a comparison. And, uh, and so uh, if you take the word pat and you just take this little line and you put it up on top, instead you have bat. I mean, look at that. The only change is the, the line goes up instead of going down. And there's a difference between if you say, I'm going to pat you on the head and I'm, or I'm going to bat you on the head, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a whole difference in meaning based on just a little part of a letter and scripture and Jesus is saying and Luke is affirming that scripture is inspired to that level, to uh, that level of detail. And so you, you look at that and, and, and then you know the prophecies as well. They've got to come to a, 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 a pass exactly like the prophet says or else they kill the prophet. And so you know, wow, there's, there's a high degree of, of, of inspiration, a high degree, a high level, even to the very details. And so it makes it easy to, when you look at scripture to know, to decide, is it, is it right? Is it wrong? Is it true? Is it not? It's one of the reasons why so many people try to come up with something that will discredit the scriptures. Oh, here we found this, and this can't be right. Uh, and like, for instance, uh, one of the things, one of the illustrations I like to tell, because I've been to both places, is Jericho. And it says they, they, were, they were leaving Jericho in one account, one of the gospel accounts. The other one says as they were approaching Jericho and they saw these blind men. One saw one, Bartimaeus, one saw multiples. And they say, see, scripture, this is the same situation. They're talking about it. And, the, and it can't be true that he's both leaving and entering. Well, actually, it could be. Archaeology has found the old Jericho and about five miles away, a new Jericho. Herod's Jericho, one was Jewish in nature, the other was Roman in nature. And I've been to both locations, so I can say, I've seen them both, they both exist, right? And, and uh, in one text, he's leaving Jericho, and he's writing, I believe, to a Jewish audience. I think it's Matthew's Gospel, but I, I could be confused about that. And then, and then the other, he's approaching Jericho. Well, he can be doing both at the same time. Actually, if you put the two accounts together, we know which way he was headed, which way he was directed. And so it tells you something to know the details, and the details have so far always been uh, affirmed by archaeology. And I don't expect that to be any different uh, moving forward. Uh, the Apostle Paul thought so strongly about the details of the text that he makes an argument based on the singular versus the plural of a word. Now, there's, there's more letters than just one to, to change in, in, in uh, the Greek text. Uh, one of them... Uh, 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 ends uh, in a, uh, in a T-I and the other in S-I-N. Uh, so there's, there's several letters that are changed, but it's the singular versus the plural. He's making his whole argument here that this is referring to, to Jesus rather than to just a general group of people based on, on the singular versus the plural of, the, of this one word. And so it's important the meaning and it's important the details. And when we study, we need to look for the details. And what I've noticed is in Bible study, a lot of times we come up with errors in our interpretation because we haven't paid attention to the text. And sometimes there's, 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 we can't make a determination about a particular question. I barrage the, te the text with questions every time I, I get into the scriptures. Sometimes I can tell you what it means and it's clear and, and other commentators see the same thing. There's other things that you'll see debate about. And those are the things that are mysteries that, have kept, that God has kept for himself. Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord our God. The things were revealed belong to us and our children forever. There are some things God just hasn't told us. Uh, and, and guess what? He's the infinite God. He's also the sovereign God. He doesn't owe me an answer. And one day we'll get some answers to some of those questions. And so just keep your set of three by five cards. Uh, so when you, when you go be before Jesus someday, you can go, hey, about this one thing, I, I had a question about this. Uh, some, some of those things I think we probably won't care about at that moment. But um, our faith is also based on the evidences before us. The archeology span has to fit. The history has to fit. 
And there are those who would, who would deny the history. They would say the history is different. You'll even see that in the issue of Jericho here. Uh, and so this is, uh, this is a, a wall in Jericho. Uh, uh, it's a, a mud brick wall. Uh, the walls fell, you remember, uh, in Jericho. And so there was question. Uh, there are some archaeologists, and some archaeologists are not believers. In some, uh, in fact, are atheists. Uh, I don't remember what uh, Kathleen Kenyon was, but she looked at this uh, after a, a guy uh, went before her and, uh, and she said, no, his dates are wrong. This isn't uh, uh, from the time of Jericho, some of the digs that she's had. She said uh, this was uh, much earlier. And in fact, uh, what she would say is that um, uh, Jericho didn't even, wasn't even inhabited when, Jer uh, when Joshua showed up. And so she's denying the biblical record and saying the biblical record isn't supported by the um, uh, record of, um, uh, of archaeology. Well, now Garstang, John Garstang in the 1930s before Kathleen Kenyon, found jars of grain. You think, why is that significant? Kathleen Kenyon found some of these jars of grain too, but she didn't find Cypriot pottery, so she said, well, it couldn't be because we would find that here at this site. What's the significance of jars of grain by a destroyed city at a, a level of destruction? You see the burning, so you know it was a level of destruction. What's the significance of that? God told them to do something whenever um, uh, that they took the city. You remember what it was? Don't take anything. Leave it. And in fact, one guy gets in trouble, right? Because he takes some stuff from Jericho. And so you think they said, God said, don't take anything. Why? You know, you always wonder, why does God ask us to do some things that doesn't seem to make any sense? Why, why did he have them leave all this stuff that they could have benefited by? Well, here's something that, that's really key. When uh, some, of, uh, early, some scholars that didn't take a Joshua date but took an earlier date uh, would say that the destruction happened as a result of the Egyptians. So how does archaeology here help us? Well, the Egyptians, when they would uh, attack a city, they would attack them right before the grain harvest so that their people, their soldiers could harvest the grain and have plenty to eat while the people in the, in the city didn't have that harvest. And so they would starve quicker. It was a smart strategy. And so they would, uh, uh, they, they would have about a three-year siege, let the people starve to death until they had no more food left. No more food left. If you have food left, you mean it, it means it was a short siege. You have these grains and grains of... Uh, and then, if the Egyptians would have taken the city in a short siege, they would have taken all of the grain with them. Why would you leave that? That was a spoil of war. The fact that it's left means that, they, that, that the layer we're looking at is exactly what... Joshua describes and what's described by the, the not taking of anything. And you wonder why, uh, what, 3,400 years ago, God said, don't take it. And I think he did it for our sake. So that in our generation, we go back and say, it's not the Egyptians. This happened because of Joshua. It happened. And isn't that amazing? I mean, that just gives me chills when you think about that. And then the Cypriot pottery that was missing, well, anytime they do a dig, if they're not looking for something, sometimes they don't sift very well. And well, uh, now people are going back and, and to the, some of these old digs and they're taking these piles of, that was discarded of dirt and they're doing wet sifting and dry sifting because they've learned some technologies and they've actually found some things. Guess what they found in Jericho, Cypriot pottery. The very thing Kathleen Kennedy said was missing and therefore it couldn't be that time frame. They, were, they, they found that, and so it, it, the archaeology points exactly to Joshua's day. There was also some other, uh, and when you look at, uh, these are a couple that I've, I've heard recently, uh, 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 Jeremiah Johnson, who I believe is at um, Preston Wood, uh, is on their staff there. Uh, he, 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 he talked about these things, and that's where I went back and did a little research on them. There was a cursed tablet. You remember uh, Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim, when Joshua goes in the land, he's supposed to, uh, he was told, you're supposed to have, uh, in fact, in, um, and Moses in Deuteronomy says this, stand on one mountain, the Mount of Blessing. You stand on the other mount, the Mount of Cursing. And basically you would say, if we obey the Lord, then we're going to be blessed, Gerizim. 
If we, don't, if we don't obey the Lord, we're going to be cursed, Mount Ebal. And they're both right there together. I've been, uh, I've been able to, in fact, I was looking for a picture where it showed both mountains. I actually took that because I was on a different mountain and I was able to see both of them and, and, and uh, uh, to see uh, basically biblical Samaria in between. And, uh, uh, and then uh, we didn't go down to Jacob's well because it wasn't safe for us to go there at that time. And so uh, they're both right there together with a town in the middle of them, like a little saddle in between where the, where the town is. And, and so this is the picture of Mount Ebal from Mount Gerizim. So what we're looking at right in front of us is Mount Gerizim and then the little uh, um, saddle. And then we see Mount Ebal. And Mount Ebal was the, the Mount of Cursings. And then they built an altar. And in fact, there's, the altar was only, uh, Joshua's altar was, on, uh, they believe it was Joshua's altar they found. It was only on Mount Ebal because when you uh, have cursings, and uh, th that's when you have sin, and therefore you need to offer sacrifice for sin. But there wasn't a similar one on Mount Gerizim uh, from Joshua's day. Well, this curse tablet was found in December 19th, uh, I mean, December of 2019, and it was found uh, through sifting through wet sifting through uh, 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 the, uh, 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 some discarded stuff, and they found this little tiny piece of lead. And this little tiny piece of lead looked kind of like this, except it was folded in half. It's about twice the size of a, a, a regular postage stamp, two centimeters by two centimeters. And, uh, and, and you think, well, how could they even tell what that is, right? They, there's, a, there's a type of um, tomographic scanning they can do and, and this tomographic scanning uh, is uh, it's like a CT scan. So then they can read the different layers. They can see what's on the different layers. They were able to actually read what was on this, this text and uh, that was previously lost. Uh, it's the earliest physical evidence that we have of Hebrew writing, which is really important. Uh, the earliest that we had before was the uh, uh, Kiafa inscription, which was during Solomon's reign, around 1,000 BC, so 3,000 years ago. That would be the earliest. This is like two to 400 years earlier than that. And uh, the documentary hypothesis, you may think, what was that? Documentary hypothesis was, uh, was a theory by Wellhausen who basically said that, that uh, there were, you know, these, these writings were not done during the time of Joshua. They were done much later. In fact, the latest one was uh, around 500 after, after the exile, and they went back and told the stories and wrote about the stories. And so they would say there were four editors, and we can know the editors by the name that they used for God. And then there was a, you know, some final redactors or editors who kind of pieced it all together and put it into one story. And they would have the Yahwehistic and the, Elo, Elohim, uh, the Elohim, the name of Elohim, the name of Yahweh. And they say those names never appear together in ancient writings, only in more modern writings. And guess what? In this one, and if you look at, uh, at, at a, uh, this is the actual translation of it, cursed, 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 cursed by the El Yahweh. Two names of God that they said never existed together in ancient writing. Oh, well, guess what? They did appear. They also said one of the reasons why there was no writing uh, in, in the uh, 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 early times of Joshua and Moses was because they were slaves. They came out of Egypt. They were illiterate. Well, guess what? They weren't illiterate either. They, they, I mean, this is an early evidence of Hebrew writing and it disproves a documentary hypothesis. There are some scholars who say, and this is uh, in effect from, uh, I believe it was the, uh, um, it was a Hebrew uh, newspaper that's uh, been around since 2007. Uh, that is uh, uh, Israel Today. It's, uh, um, uh, I think, Israel Hayom or something like that. And it's, it's basically said, this is the greatest find of our century, maybe of all archeology. span I mean, they're saying this is a huge find uh, uh, in, their, in, their, in their thinking. Um, and so uh, when you look at this, you realize, wow, this is, this is significant. So Joshua 8 is proven to be true by archaeology, even though since the 1950s, people have followed Kathleen Kenyon and said, oh, well, she must be right. I mean, she's an archaeologist after all, and the evidence doesn't support it. And, and, and guess what? The evidence actually does support it, in fact, in a very strong way, more so than what she did. And it shows some of the flaws in some of her, her uh, thinking. So 
when you look at it, we have physical evidence and, and we have archeological evidence that supports the scriptures and even to the details of the text that we see. Uh, we, we, uh, uh, and so we have to ask ourselves a question. So are, are we supposed to see things in an absolute sense or in a relative sense? And you see a very subjective uh, uh, approach to scripture in our day called deconstruction. Deconstruction is basically uh, one of the things that we have to address early on as we deal with this issue of deconstruction is s many of the people who are deconstructionists have gone through some sort of abuse, uh, either at the hands of a church, uh, a church member, uh, a pastor, those kind of things. And they've gone back and because of that abuse, they've reevaluated uh, uh, what they think about religion and Christianity and the scriptures. And... Um, uh, you know, the thing that we can't overlook is whenever they, whenever uh, we talk about deconstruction, they think that we are dismissing their story and we're belittling their story and, and it couldn't be further from the truth. I would not want to dismiss their story. There are things in religious systems that need to change and need to be addressed. And so those things are important for us. And so in no way am I saying anything uh, a, a negative about their story, about the struggle, about the abuses, not meaning to belittle that at all. But one thing that's happened is there's an abuse that has happened as a result of this, and that is with the scriptures. The scriptures have wrongly been included in being culpable for this destruction. The scriptures never, never encourage a, a Christian uh, leader to be abusive in any way or anybody in the church to be that as well. And so I think that that has to be addressed early on and has to be uh, stated. But when we look at this idea of deconstruction, we need to ask ourselves, you know, why did this come about? There's, you'll, uh, if you do much study on it, you'll, it won't be long before you'll see the name of Derrida. He was a French philosopher, considered the father of deconstruction. Uh, and so um, uh, it's, it's, it, he's the one that coined that term back in the 1960s. Uh, and basically the idea of deconstructionism is that you want to analyze a text. You want to analyze, say, the scriptures, and then you want to see what are the hidden eternal assumptions, contradictions, and, uh, and, then you, and, and things that subvert truth, basically. And so uh, it would be like saying she likes to deconstruct the text to discover or uncover what they're not saying. And so they th figure there's things in scripture that are not being said or that are being overlooked or whatever, or that are overlooking a, you know, patriarchy or, or something like that. And so that's uh, the part of the analysis that they do. And they say that as Christians, we're just kind of ignorantly uh, jumping into the scriptures and believing them, right? Well, there's some presuppositions to this idea of deconstruction. One is that it embraces the subjective rather than the objective. Scripture is objective truth. Uh, uh, the all, almost all deconstruction that leads away from the scriptures buys into some sort of form of subjectivism. It's also anti-supernatural. In fact, you'll see that deconstructionists call themselves historical. And what they mean by that is different than what I mean. I mean historical like the evidence supports it because of what, like what we just shared about Jericho or about the curse tablets on Mount Ebal. Uh, that's what I mean by historical. What they mean is the historical means that, oh, that couldn't have happened that way. I mean, really, you know, somebody rising from the dead, no, that couldn't happen. You know, that's what uh, uh, one of our founding fathers, Thomas Jefferson, did. He went out and cut out all the miracles in the scriptures, including the resurrection, because obviously those couldn't happen. Deists would do that because they say, well, uh, miracles can't happen. They would destroy science, and so therefore they can't occur. And so it's a very anti-supernatural. You want to get rid of all the embellishments, uh, which are supernatural. Uh, it's an evolution of religion approach that somehow we're just writing about uh, all these people in Scripture are writing about God and about their concept of God. And, and so uh, it's, it's and, and they're developing and we're developing our understanding. So God develops along with us. It's kind of along the lines of uh, panentheism as well. Uh, then it also argues that some issues are just first century issues. Well, you could say that about the whole New Testament, right? Oh, those were all, the whole New Testament is first century issues. But then you kind of said too much. Once you say that, you can say, well, New Testament talks about murder. That was just a first century issue. Oh, wow. And you think, well, I, nobody would do that. What about the, the unborn? You know, you think about we've we've changed on, a, on our on our understanding of what morality is in so many areas because we say, oh, well, that was just a first century issue or that belong, that was just applied to a particular church. 
And once you say that, you've opened up a huge can of worms, and that's an argument that you have to be very cautious about considering. The deconstructionism has a process. Uh, Paul Ricoeur said that the, the process happens when there's a first innocence, where you uh, just quickly uh, accept something that you're reading, and then there's a critical distance where you begin to kind of look at it and you think, oh, well, wait a minute, you know, maybe this is not what it first seems. And then there's a second innocence, and you'll see that talking, uh, being talked about in, in circles where you deconstruct, and then you have this healthier spirituality, but your healthy spirituality went from a spirituality that was supernatural to one that's anti-supernatural. Is that healthier? I don't think so. And so you look at this, uh, and now when I think of my own journey, my, my first innocence was when I was 17 uh, as a student, as a college student, and I was studying the scriptures, and man, I was eating it up. The critical distance is whenever I went to seminary and began to realize, oh, there's a lot more questions than I realized existed. And so I began to evaluate passages and things that I had once known, but the second innocence still retained the scriptures. And so it became a more robust faith, not a deconversion, uh, which uh, I think is important for us to understand. Deconstruction does not mean the same thing as deconversion. We put them both together, they don't mean the same thing. You can have a deconstruction that leads to a deconversion, you can have a deconstruction that leads to a more robust faith. Uh, and, and we see that uh, in scripture, even with the Bereans I'll talk about in a second. Here's a, here's a deconstruction that leaves scripture apart and leaves this away. Uh, I just found, uh, I just heard an Alicia Childers uh, uh, where she talks about this with, uh, I think with the uh, red pen, uh, uh, what? Logic, red pen logic, yeah. Red pen logic uh, with Tim Barnett, yeah, Tim Barnett. And, uh, and so he mentioned this, so I went on uh, uh, the Naked Pastors site, uh, interesting name, uh, and, uh, and, and he said, uh, it says, it has one sheep saying, but the verses, talking about the scripture. And then it has the words of Jesus, love over verses. And so it's, all of a sudden you kind of go, wait a minute, something's changed here. Jesus said his own words in his mouth, not the smallest letter or dot or part of a letter, right? And now they have Jesus saying, oh, that's not a big deal. Not... And so it's, it's going exactly against what scripture says. And so it's, and it, and it goes from objective to subjective in order to embrace a certain uh, idea. And so it's, it's used to override, deconstruction be, be used to override the scriptures with another truth system altogether that's very subjective uh, instead of examining the scriptures and having a robust faith. I love Acts 17. I think it's something we should be doing. We should be, in a sense, deconstructing in the healthy sense of the word where we're wrestling with the meaning of a passage, but we're not doing it on our own. We're not doing it subjectively. We're going and we're looking at what are the other commentators say? What are some other godly people? that? What's the verification process of my interpretation so that I don't just run off with some interpretation that I you know, have a harebrained idea about. And so uh, these Jews, it talks about in Acts 17, were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word of God with eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. And so they were trying to understand, they were trying to come to an understanding of the scriptures and to see what Paul was saying because it was changing their view of scripture. It was changing their view of the Old Testament. And they were gonna, these Jews were gonna have to, if, they, if Paul was right, were gonna have to leave behind their previous understanding that circumcision was important, that other things were important, keeping the law was important to grace and to Jesus. And so uh, it was a huge change for them. It would be a deconstruction of their faith, but moving toward what God was doing. Uh, now there's the question because of these things, were Jesus and Luther deconstructionists? And they would say, uh, you know, Jesus said, you heard it said, but I say to you, in other words, he's changing what was said. But the interesting thing is that, no, he's, he's still holding to the scriptures. He isn't saying, okay, let's just throw away the scriptures and go to something else. He's saying to a higher degree than what you heard. You think that it's uh, uh, murder is important. Well, I, I can tell you hating your brother is, is, is a higher level and you're, you're guilty of murder if you hated your brother. And so he's, he's uh, describing the scriptures, still holding to the scriptures. Uh, uh, he violated the Sabbath. Well, he was just violating their rules about the Sabbath, not the actual Sabbath rule itself. Uh, and then the, uh, 
tables of the money changers. He's throwing over a religious system. He's not throwing off. off. And in fact, he's saying you're, you're violating. In fact, he, with Corbin, he says you're violating the, the scriptures because you're saying this is dedicated to God. And the word of God says, honor your father and your mother. And so when they're old and, and they need help, you say, oh, I'm sorry, all my stuff's dedicated to God. I can't help you. And all of a sudden he says, you're violating the scriptures by your traditions. And so uh, it's one thing to, to discard traditions in favor of the word of God. It's another thing to discard the word of God altogether. Uh, and so uh, you see Luther doing something similar. He actually had a deconversion from his Catholic faith and began uh, uh, moving in the Protestant direction uh, with the issue of indulgences. He felt like that if Pope had the right to forgive sins. He should do it for free rather than charging for it. And so he was really wrestling with some of those issues and he was studying the book of Romans. And he came away with faith alone in Christ alone because of his study of the scriptures. And so he moved away from religious ideas to the scriptures, not some other way. Um, if they did, they you know, did any kind of deconstruction, they did it according to the scriptures. Uh, they were saying that organized religion had gotten away from the scriptures, away from biblical truth. And so they were, the question is, is this in line with what the Bible teaches? Uh, you see other deconstruction today that's in light of sociology, history, critical theory, personal preferences, personal experiences, oppression, uh, and then, you know, in light of Fill in the blank. I mean, there's any number of things that it could be not in light of Scripture. That's a completely different system, a completely different thing. Uh, John Cooper of Skillet uh, has uh, uh, turned out to be quite the theologian. He speaks a lot uh, about different things, and he speaks about this idea of deconstruction. He says, some say the term simply means reading the Bible afresh and being willing to challenge your beliefs that uh, may be based on traditional thinking, but they may sound harmless and even virtuous, but there, is no, uh, there are two major distinctions uh, that need to be addressed, and he addresses them. One, he says, is uh, uh, those who hold to a conviction that the Bible is uh, God's authoritative word and therefore approach it with faith, they're allowing for the Holy Spirit to guide them into a deeper conviction of sin, a deeper love for Jesus and his perfection, and a deeper understanding of what is righteous and what is evil. Uh, but then he says, too, then there are those who read the Bible afresh, but without faith. I think that's the key statement. It's anti-supernatural. It's without faith. And without a belief that the Bible is God's authoritative word, they consider the words on its pages of no greater or lesser importance than any other book, religion, or TikTok influencer. Rather, they use their own feelings and intellect to decide what they agree with and what they disagree with. It becomes a cafeteria-style religion. I know probably many, many of you haven't been to Luby's, but uh, you go to a cafeteria, you get to choose what you want, and then you leave the rest, and that's the approach to Scripture, is you just take what you like and you leave the rest. That's very convenient. Uh, whenever it's addressing an issue of your sin, you go, oh, I'm going to leave that one. I kind of like that sin. I want to hang on to it. Uh, then he also talks about this idea of deconstruction is the heading most recently applied to the process of questioning, doubting, and ultimately rejecting aspects of Christian faith. There is an application of deconstructionism, uh, an approach that claims to uh, disassemble uh, beliefs and ideas while assuming their meanings are inherently subjective. So it's a very subjective and he's, he affirms what we've been looking at. Some of the people that have uh, led in this direction of subjectivism or relativism, and the problem with relativism, uh, as I, I've mentioned before, is uh, the minute I say all things are relative, you have to ask the question, is that statement relative or is it absolute? Uh, if I say it's absolute, I've got a one absolute system. Uh, if I say that it's relative, I just said nothing because it changed the minute I said it, and so it's self-defeating. And so there's a problem with the whole issue of, uh, of relativism, uh, but we like it anyway, our culture does anyway, and, uh, and subjectivism. Peter Inns, who uh, wrote the uh, book, uh, uh, The Bible Tells Me So, and some others has been a, a proponent of this idea of subjectivism, uh, and he uses this illustration of children, children telling a story that their parents have told them, for instance. And they tell the story, and some of the details they get right, and some they get, uh, uh, they're confused about, and some get other things still plain wrong. 
And they're saying that's the way it is with the scriptures. That's what he says it's with the scriptures. They're getting some things just wrong. And so those things have to be discarded. And of course, once you open that can of worms, it's like, what do you decide is wrong? And you end up eventually discarding the whole thing. So uh, that's Peter ends. Uh, then also you see another statement of his that he talks about God's rule book. And I've heard that recently. Somebody saying, oh, the Bible's just God's rule book. And so uh, he says, uh, this rule book view of the Bible is like a knockoff Chanel handbag. For as fine as long as it's kept at a distance away from curious and probing eyes. In other words, it doesn't stand up under scrutiny is what he's saying, the scriptures. The problem is, and this is just my analysis, uh, is the Bible is not a rule book. Uh, there are some rules in the scriptures. You see that in Exodus. You see that in Deuteronomy uh, and, and other places, uh, especially the, the Torah. Uh, but here's, this, here's the problem that I have with that. The purpose of those things was to prove that we couldn't keep them. It wasn't intended for us to keep them. So somebody who says the Bible's just a rule book and therefore I've discarded it doesn't understand the Bible because the Bible is not intended for that. And in fact, Paul talks about this in Galatians. He says we are actually imprisoned under the law. We are imprisoned under the rules. I mean, that's a, and I used the ESV because it was so strongly stated. I loved it. It says imprisoned until, the key word until, the coming faith would be revealed. In other words, the faith that would come because of Christ. Uh, in Galatians, uh, the very next verse, and I use the New American Standard here because I, I like the translation of that verse by the New American Standard. It says, therefore the law has become our tutor. It's become our tutor. It's a, it's a teacher. Uh, and it's, it uses the word guardian in some of the other ones. And guardian doesn't quite capture, guardian has the idea of protecting. No, it has the idea of teaching. It's our teacher to teach us we can't keep the law and that we need Christ. We need a sin bearer that can bear our sin for us because we can't keep it. And so it's not a rule book. It's an anti-rule book. It's to show us that we can't keep it. And that uh, the, uh, uh, and maybe anti-rule book is a little too strong, but it's this idea that it's an x-ray machine. X-ray machine reveals the break, but it can't fix the break. And the law was intended to reveal that we couldn't keep it and that we would need a savior and that savior would be Jesus Christ and everything pointed to this coming Messiah uh, all through the, uh, the Old Testament. And so what I realized about Peter Enns when I was doing an analysis of some of his stuff and I, I read some reviews and the reviews were talking about different things about, about his theology. I haven't seen too many and maybe there's some now because uh, I haven't looked recently, but I think that he's following Karl Barth. Karl Barth, I mean, because he said, uh, Peter ends, Jesus, not the Bible, has the final word. Well, what does that mean? How do you know about Jesus without the Bible? And so you're talking somehow subjectiveness, uh, some subjective experience with God, which is exactly what Barth's view of inspiration was, is that we read the Bible with all its errors, and whenever we have this emotional or this experience or this encounter with the Christ, who is the Word of God, uh, that that's without error, but the, 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 the written Word has errors. And that's, that's a problem. And that's very subjective because then it can mean anything that I want it to mean. I can make up. And I'm a very creative guy. If, you, if, you, if I went that direction, you're going to see a whole lot of creativity in regard to that and a whole lot of allowances for myself and probably fewer allowances for you. Uh, and so that's what you see. Uh, and, and so I believe that he's buying right out of Karl Barth's uh, rule, uh, 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 view. He says, I take, uh, Karl Barth says, I take the Bible far too seriously to take it literally. And you go, oh, no, you're not taking it serious enough, in my estimation. Uh, there's also a guy named J. Hillis Miller that I, that I, I looked at uh, recently. It's just a statement. He says, deconstruction is not a dismantling of the structure of a text, but a demonstration that has already dismantled itself. So he's going even a step further. He's even saying it's stronger. And you kind of go, wow. I mean, there's, there, is a, there is an attack on the scriptures that is very, uh, very unhealthy and very strong. Uh, but, the, but what it causes us to do is to evaluate and to really think through the details of it ourselves. The scripture can handle itself, by the way. 
Doesn't need Greg Buckles to defend it. Doesn't need, you know, the, I was thinking about that. You know, the, ever since the, the first writings were done by Moses, uh, you know, uh, uh, some 3,500 years ago or, or, or earlier, uh, you, you look at that and you think, um, you know, I wasn't around then and, and God's done pretty well for himself to handle the scriptures and defend the scriptures without me, without us. They stand on their own. They stand. And, and so what we're doing is just revealing and finding out what the scriptures already uh, defend and, and already have protected. It's like uh, I heard a guy t uh, years ago that talked about uh, dogs barking at the moon. The moon's going around the, the earth and dogs in, in India barking at the moon and, and, and dogs in Indonesia barking at the moon and, and, and in Africa barking at the moon. Guess what? The moon hasn't changed a bit with all the barking, neither has the word of God. With all the theologians or so-called so theologians, uh, God's word has stood uh, and standed the test of time and everything that comes along the pike uh, uh, supports the findings that we have in scripture and not the other way around. Uh, I think fulfilled Bible prophecy is a key part of this process. We see that uh, uh, scripture indicates that, that the scriptures have to be fulfilled exactly uh, as, as the prophet said, Deuteronomy 18. If they don't, then, then uh, you, you kill the prophet and you throw away and discard what he says. And so we think, well, what about Bible prophecy being fulfilled? And so you think, well, what's the, what's the likelihood of eight prophecies about Jesus being fulfilled. What do you think the odds are for that? Eight of those. Uh, somebody did the math, I didn't do it, so I'm just taking what they had. Odds of winning the lottery, 259,000, uh, uh, I mean 259 million to one. Uh, and, and you think uh, that's why in the United States not very few people can say, oh yeah, I won the lottery, right? Uh, odds of eight prophecies, one in 100, uh, uh, quadrillion, not just trillion, quadrillion. Uh, and, and, uh, and Jesus fulfilled over 300 prophecies, uh, and I have a list here of 26 of them. And when you look at that list and you, and you think about the things that Jesus did, virgin born, born in Bethlehem, flight to Egypt, I mean, all the different things uh, called Emmanuel, uh, his ministry, his triumphant entry into Jerusalem, I mean, all the things that were fulfilled about Christ, just these 26, even more than 100 quadrillion. I don't even know what the number is. I'm sure it's astronomical at that point. 100 quadrillion is pretty astronomical too. Uh, and so you, you look at that and you think, our Lord uh, our, our, uh, fulfilled all of these 300 prophecies about him. And we're just looking at Jesus' prophecy, not even about other things that occurred uh, uh, that uh, in scripture that were prophesied about, Cyrus for one or others. Uh, and so there's other prophecies, not just the ones about Jesus. Uh, and so the word of God has so much to, to support a literal understanding, a supernatural understanding. We don't have to say, oh, it's just men's thoughts about God. It's God's revealing himself to us. And when we read the word of God, it can change our hearts. It can change our lives. And, and, and uh, uh, Isaiah 55, 11 said his word's not going to go out uh, uh, empty, but without, without accomplishing what he's desired. And so even now, I mean, the question that I had is, how can I, as a guy who's in a category of person, an old white guy, continue to preach the word when people say, oh, he's just maintaining his position of authority, uh, of oppression of our, our world because he's teaching a Bible in order to maintain and establish. And I, and I had to go back and say, Lord, what do I do with this? Well, I don't change. I keep preaching the word. Because God's word still says in Isaiah 55, 11, it's what's gonna accomplish it. And it's not me maintaining a position. I'm gonna die at some point, right? I'm not maintaining anything except that I'm going to die at one point. What am I doing? I'm wanting people to know what God has said. Thus the Lord has said. In fact, we've been reading through Jeremiah in our, uh, as our, uh, reading the Bible in a year. And it says, thus says the Lord. I mean, so many times, this is what the Lord says. He's not saying this is what Jeremiah says, the prophet says. He says, this is what the Lord said. And it was a very unpopular message. He was even thrown in a cistern, left to die. No water in the cistern, only mud. And, and then he got pulled back out. And I think, wow, he was willing to give everything for, for his belief that God is, had said uh, a certain thing, and he was willing to go to the king and say the most unpopular message. 
And we, when we see that through the scriptures, the, even, the, even Jesus talks about the, the prophets being put to death because of their preaching of the word, their defending of God's word. And we think, how, why should we think it's going to be any different in our generation? And so when we look at the scriptures, they have a lot to commend them, a lot to support them. It's not just a blind faith. It's a faith where the evidence points. That's the faith that we hold. And it's an incredible faith. Thank you.